The largest population of wild horses in the world can be found in the US, wild American Mustangs. The Mustang story is a dramatic one. A hundred years ago, these horses were ruthlessly exploited. They were captured in their thousands and used in wartime. And at the same time, the Wild West was being colonized by settlers, resulting in reduced habitat and diminishing food sources for the Mustangs. In the space of a single century, the number of wild Mustangs dropped from around 2 million to just 40,000. Today, Mustangs are no longer threatened, and there is great respect for these horses. The way in which they are treated when captured and tamed shows that Americans have truly taken the Mustangs into their hearts. Wild Mustangs live mainly in the western states, particularly in the state of Nevada. Mustangs herd together in small bands of seven to 12 horses. Each band has a harem stallion, and the rest are mares and foals. The stallion is almost always at a slight distance from his harem, keeping a watchful eye out for rival stallions. But although the stallion is the leader of the herd, the lead mare always goes first, and the others all follow. There are often bands of young stallions close to the herd. They have not yet established a harem of their own and group together in what are known as bachelor bands. These groups stay close to the herd, waiting for an opportunity to run off with some of the leading stallion's mares. No luck this time, and they slope off. Mustangs were originally tame horses brought over from Spain to America 500 years ago. The horses which escaped the Spaniards have run free ever since, living by the laws of nature out on the great American plains in an open and harsh environment. The American authorities want to maintain the population at its current level. The authorities estimate that on the open spaces left in Midwest America, there is only enough food and water to maintain a population of about 40,000 wild horses. Leaving them unchecked, I mean, the population in a few years will just explode. And pretty soon, you'll have horses starving to death out here. Uh, they'll be fighting over waters. Um, they'll drink water holes dry because some of the waters are very limited on how much they produce. Mustangs are very prolific and the population would grow annually by many thousands if the numbers were not kept in check. To keep the population at the current 40,000, the American authorities have to gather around 10,000 wild horses each year. The work team is getting ready to start the gather. They are wranglers, not cowboys. To them, cowboy is a derogatory word. They work for the American authority known as BLM, Bureau of Land Management. Mustangs are completely protected and may only be captured by the BLM. They may not be hunted nor caught for commercial purposes. Do we want to go take a quick look? Well, and yeah, see we that... look. No, I mean right at this and see. Yeah. He's in traps. Yeah, and that's where all those yeah, horses right were here. sitting. Was right in here. Right, right and that's where we're going. No panic. Okay, line, everything's so. ready. We're Relax. Relax, right Bob. Right. We'll take care of you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Traps are strategically set to blend into the landscape. We try not to interfere with the animals on the range any more than we have to. And so pretty much what that amounts to is we go out and monitor the herds, um, evaluate their habitat, evaluate the animal's health. And then when we have an identified need where maybe the rangeland's in poor condition or the animals are not responding well, then we'll conduct a removal. Even before the trap is finished, pilot Jim Hicks is sent off in his helicopter. Helicopters and wranglers on horseback are used to gather the wild horses. 
Jim is probably the best horse pilot that they've ever had or ever will have. You not only have to be a skilled pilot, you have, you have to have an understanding of wild horses and, and what, a, what a wild horse is capable of doing and, and kind of understand their tendencies. I think a lot of times uh, Jim knows what a horse is going to do before he does it. The inside of the trap is almost ready. Large rolls of burlap are erected as a fence to guide the horses into the trap. The horses see the burlap as a wall they cannot go through. Jim Hicks has found the first herd. He waits with driving them in. Firstly, he wants to get an idea of how many herds are in the area. He drives several herds together before leading them back to the corral. A dust of cloud reveals a new herd of Mustangs. almost 20 kilometers from the trap and now sends a message back that he's beginning to drive the horses in. But firstly, he needs to get the horses out from under the trees and down onto open terrain. These maneuvers are dangerous. Jim has crashed several times when his rotor blades came too close to the treetops, but up to now, he has escaped unharmed. Three stallions have run off. The stallions are the most difficult to drive in, and they are not as easily frightened by the helicopter. On previous gathers, Jim has had to get close to the ground, pushing the stallions with the helicopter's skids in order to drive them back into the herd. We always have radio contact with the helicopter and we're continually talking back and forth about what obstacles he's coming to, uh, what we need to do. Is there any baby colts? Is there any old horses that can't keep up? So the communication's a big item and we try as hard as we can not to ever drop a colt. And if we do, we always go back and get it if we can find it. Out on the open plain, Jim Hicks is careful not to drive the horses on too hard so that foals and older individuals don't get left behind. When the herd approaches the trap, there are more problems with the stallions. They run off to all sides, and Jim Hicks has to ask the wranglers for help. Dave gets the specially trained Judas horses ready. These horses have been given this less than flattering name because they lure the wild horses into the trap. Once we get the horses down to the, down to the mouth of the trap, uh, uh, a Judas horse or a Prada horse has turned loose. This is a horse that's, uh, that's trained to go to the trap and horses, you know, are, are herd animals, are following animals. And uh, once this uh, a Prada horse is turned loose, and the wild horses will follow it on into the trap, and then the wranglers come in behind and, and close the gate.
the Judas horses are immediately separated from the wild ones. They do settle down pretty quick if you don't stir them. And we've learned over the years to not handle any of them a horseback. Uh, a wild horse is scared to death of somebody a horseback. And I think it comes from something on their back. They uh, related to a lion or something jumping on their back. You take a helicopter, he was probably out there, what, 45 minutes? Yeah, and, and then they're here. They're here, it's yeah, all over. Yeah, you sort yeah. them, it's done with, and yeah. they haven't wore their feet yeah. to nothing. Amongst the captured horses is a rarity an albino horse, but it is over 10 years old and will be released again. Some of these stallions, they absolutely hate each other, and um, I've, I've seen them where they fight coming into the wings at the end of the trap, fighting going onto the trailer, they fight in the trailer, and then we turn them into the stallion pen and they fight there until yeah, we ship. They I've fight seen that on the, too. They yeah. fight on the truck They're when really we ship them mean. to Palomino Valley. They're really mean. They are. They can kill a mare, they can kill a colt real yeah. easily. We separate them here for the same reason, yeah. so they don't get killed inside the pen here. Yeah. Back whenever things were first starting, there were more horses lost. I know when I first started in the horse program, mm -hmm. up to 5% was acceptable death loss, and now if you get over 1%, they're questioning right. what's going on. Most accidents happen because the horses think they can go through the bars and so they run directly into them. But now, black plastic snow fences are put up around the bars, and these accidents rarely happen anymore. Before we uh, was working them and loading them, before we start using them on the outside of it, you know, we broke quite a few necks because you, they'd, they'd jump at them panels and try to go through them. The moment the Mustangs are in the enclosure, the foals are removed. They're also kept separate from the adult horses when being transported on trailers, otherwise, the foals are at risk of being squashed to death under the very stressful conditions. We're sorting off the colts into the small pen over there so where they don't go on the trailer loads with the big horses to keep them from getting kicked or trampled. Because if we put them on the trailer with the big ones, they could get killed on there. They're tough animals, and the more you get to know them, the environment they live in, the life they've led to get to this point, the more you respect them. The gathers continue until late afternoon. Jim Hicks makes four more runs and brings in over 120 horses that day. After five days, around 400 Mustangs have been caught and are transported to Palomino Valley. The trap is dismantled and moved to another area. Palomino Valley is the American authorities' central reception area for captured Mustangs. There is space here for around 2,000 horses. The last of the captured horses arrive. Typically when the wild horses come in off the range from a, a gather operation, the very first thing they'll do is we'll run them through our squeeze chutes and let the veterinarian take a look at them to make sure if they have any physical injuries or if they have anything that requires immediate attention, then he could administer to them. 
And then after that, what they'll do is give them the, the normal range of vaccines for a domestic horse. And then we also give each horse an individual identification number. Um, that's that freeze mark that you'll see on their neck. Um, each animal is individually identified. It'll tell the age of the horse. And um, that's tied to another code that we assign to the animal called a signalment key, which is based on the sex of the animal, um, the coloration of it, face whirls. And that way, through our computer system, we can track each individual animal. Once it receives its freeze mark and its vaccinations, we turn it out into these pens. And we'll keep it for at least 30 days so that it could get its booster vaccinations. A Mustang is anesthetized so that the vets can clean a wound on its shoulder. So we've given him the anesthetic now. The anesthetic takes 10 seconds to work. The wound is disinfected with iodine. The vet lances the wound and presses out the pus. All right, guys. You want to try this other hole, Rick? The wound is superficial and will heal quickly. The health of the Mustangs is good. Amongst the 400 horses gathered, not one is lame. The horses possess what vets call clean legs, no bulging at the joints, and strong and healthy hooves. You could ride them for weeks and weeks and never shoe them because they have perfect hard feet. You take a saddle horse, keep him in the corral for 10 years, and shoe him every six weeks. What do you do? You halfway destroy their feet. You do. Yes, uh, you destroy true. their ability to pump blood to their feet. Yeah. When you wear your feet down, like these are, then you have terrific healthy feet. Yeah. Actually, to shoe a horse, you should shoe him for six weeks and then trim him down and turn him out for a month. Six weeks, two months, that's the limit. Yeah. And then they should be barefooted for a while. Yeah. So a wild horse has got terrific feet. But the reason they are is because no man don't mess with them. In the mountains here at Snake River, something very dramatic happened over three million years ago. A great number of horses died in a short period of time. What we're currently thinking is that it was a drought and that a shallow river was drying up. And horses are very, very much dependent on a water source. So eventually, you're going to have the animals dying out. And you can imagine the bottom of this dried up river covered with dead horses. This mass death has left the area around Snake River with one of the largest collections of horse fossils in the world. What makes this particular site so exciting is that it is the single largest sample of the modern horse genus Equus. And so we're looking at a population of animals, over 200 that have been found here, that allows us to really understand the origin and the evolutionary history of the modern horse group. The fossils are embedded in hard rock and are impossible to remove on site. So blocks of rock containing the fossils are transported to laboratories. And here, paleontologists work to free the fossils from the rock. The horses found at Snake River are the forefathers of all living horses today. This is the oldest and the first species of the modern horse genus Equus. So we can think of this as the ancestral form, not only for Chevalsky's horse, but for what eventually gave rise to zebras and donkeys. 
So this is sort of the basic model from which the other living horse lineages could be derived. So what did it look like, the forefather of horses? If you start looking at details of the skeleton, we can say it's really more zebra-like than horse-like. And apparently some features of the skeleton suggest that this was very much like the living grevy zebra in Africa today. It's on the North American continent that the horse originated, a process which has taken 55 million years. And from here, it migrated to Asia, Europe, and other continents. Over the last 55 million years, the horse has evolved from being the size of a cat to the large animal we know today. The horse became larger and heavier, and at some point in its history, it had to adapt so that it was able to run. As grasslands develop, the forests break up, we see a lot of this adaptation for running probably related to open country. There's no place to hide from predators. If you look at this horse here, he's already down to one toe, like the modern horse. And this is part of the long evolutionary history of horses becoming adapted for running, which includes reducing the number of their toes. 10,000 years ago, the horse totally disappeared from the North American continent. 10,000 years ago, Equus disappeared here in North America at the end of the Ice Age, along with mammoths, mastodons, camels, and other large herbivores. And one of the great mysteries is, is why here in North America, a group of animals like the horse that was so successful for so many millions of years disappeared, and yet it was able to survive in Eurasia American Mustangs only descend indirectly from their original American ancestors. And this was through the horses which migrated to Asia and on to Europe two million years ago, only to return to the North American continent with the help of man 500 years ago. The horse returned home to its place of origin. Apart from the authorities themselves, only one private individual in America has been given permission to tame wild horses. His name is Steve Mantle, and he is one of the famous horse whisperers, someone who can do things with horses that no one else can. The newly captured horses are sorted. Stallions over a certain age are removed they are not suitable for riding because it would be impossible to tame them completely. The stallions will be released into large sanctuaries. It is necessary to be able to identify them from the air, so they are freeze marked with an extra large identification code. Good horsemanship to me would be someone who is willing to learn new things, that has no ego involved. They're, they're out there for the horse. They're not out there for themselves. They're willing to be honest. Um, they're not trying to snowball anybody with anything phony. Uh, because if the horse can win, in every situation, whether it's a Mustang or a domestic horse or whatever it is, uh, ultimately the owner, the rider, and the trainer are going to win. If the horse doesn't win, nobody wins. It's when Steve Mantle stands before an individual horse that you can see his very special abilities. We're going to introduce to this little horse something that he's looking for. Uh, he's in here all by himself. 
and the natural thing for him to do is be with a herd of horses. That's where he's the safest. So we're going to try to take the place of the herd in his mind and teach him that when he's with us, that's a good thing, and when he's away from us, it's a bad thing. And he's going he's gonna to learn to start coming with us and being with me here just pretty quick because he's already looking for somebody. That's why he's doing all this pacing and working around here. Now he's come to this gate right here because that's where he came in. So that's where he wants to go right back out. These wild horses naturally zero in on things like that. So we're going to strengthen the right side of the horse first. Build the right eye strong and drive him. Now to drive a horse you got to do it from the hips. You can't do it from the ribs or the shoulder. So we're just going to keep driving him around here and then we're going to offer him a chance to come back. It's starting to sink in really quick. Now we lost his attention, now we got it back. See how we got both ears right here now? We lost it, now we got it back. Lost it, now we got it back. Once you get this here, your, your training process is starting to really build quick. Now I've got to send him around the other direction because now he's okay with me on the right. So now we got to get him okay with me on the left. I'm going to have to hustle him to get him by the camera. Now we're going to hustle him again and let him coast. Oh, he's already wanting. See, he's a pretty smart little horse. He's finding the answer. The horse can read your body language, um, and he reads it better than you ever thought of reading his. First off, in his mind, you're a predator when you come in the trail. Um, and then after a while he finds out, well, you really haven't attacked me yet. So then if you can set your body language to where he can work off that, then you start building that relationship right there. Now, believe it or not, this horse has never been worked. He's been run through the chute, castrated and branded, and that's it. But like I say, now see he's having a hard time staying here, so we're going to put some pressure and get him hooked back on. Now we're going to come again and get another adjustment there. That's better. Now this little horse doesn't know that being petted is a good thing. So you have to teach him that it's a good thing. And they might nip you. You just have to be aware of that, be ready for it, and watch out for it. But once they find out that being petted is a good thing, the rest of your process is pretty easy. There's a saying out there that if you look these horses in the eyes that you send them away, well, my experience is the eyes are the window to the soul, and if you want to know what's going on in his mind, you better be looking at his eyes and his ears and checking that out. Because I'm looking right dead in his eyes, and he's sure not wanting to leave very bad. Now, I don't know what we've been at it, a half hour, 45 minutes, maybe? Yeah, yeah. and then that is quick. Yeah, and we've got a we've got a two-year-old wild Mustang that is really at this point right here not a whole lot different than a domestic two-year-old that's been run out on the range. The only thing is his sense of self-preservation is like up here and a domestic horse is down here, because every horse has it. I mean that's how they survive. We're going to use this flag as a training tool rather than a weapon. So many people use this flag as a weapon because they get scared and they don't know what else to do, so they just shake the daylights out of it. We're going to let him check it out. This represents your head, your hat, your shoulders. And if the wind blows your hat off and it comes floating down to the ground, it's going to bother him if you haven't taken this away. Now, if you're out riding this horse someplace and a plastic sack blows by 
I see that front foot come off the ground right there. He had to, natural. I mean, he just, he couldn't help it. But pretty quick, he'll just stand here and this will go floating by and he won't even look at it. Okay, now he set himself up for us to see if we can't teach him something. We're just gonna put enough pressure there that he just made the turn right there. And now he is just so tickled. He knows he did something. He don't know what he did, but he did something. And it turned out to be pretty good because he's really troubled with that rope around behind him. He worked himself out of it. And there was no more pressure. And then now we're in here and we're gonna give him just a little bit of reward. Let the horse learn that he can work off the pressure and he can find release and relief when he comes off that pressure. If the pressure's never released, he has no incentive to come off of it. Um, but if it is, he'll just, I mean, he'll start out to where they're resisting it, then pretty quick they're accepting it, and then they'll be turning so light and handling so nice because they're craving it. I mean, it's like, oh yeah, I can do this. And they want to do it. If he wants to go on by, that's fine, because what we're going to teach him is by going on by, he's going to get into pressure. But if he stops right where you are, there's no pressure. Whoa. Oh. Boom. It's okay, he got a good education right there. <laughs> that didn't hurt him at all. No. After just two hours' work, Steve Mantle judges how far he has progressed. If the horse allows him to lift its leg, he has won the horse's confidence. The legs are extremely sensitive and many horse owners, even after years of riding, are not allowed to touch their horse's legs. I usually get this right here, first or second day. Do you think this uh, trust you gained here will, will uh, the horse give that to another person or do you step very much back if there's another person coming in? <coughs> you want to try me out? I think you can go right up between his eyes. After you, sir. I really admire them. They're, to me, they're, they're like the coyote. They're adaptable. Probably the last three things left on the face of this earth will be them, the coyote, and the house fly. The free life of the Mustangs has forced them to survive on nature's terms. This has made them strong and healthy. So vets and other people interested in horses have began to study Mustangs and compare them with the modern saddle horse. A lot of veterinarians have studied them to see why wild horses don't get navicular and all this. Too much the concept today is every horse has got to have a halter on him and it's got to have shoes on it. Well, if you keep shoes on it 12 months out of the year, in term, over the years, you will shorten his lifespan of his feet by 50% at least. Joint and bone disease are some of the most common ailments among modern saddle horses. These diseases 
often develop into chronic conditions, making the horse lame and therefore useless as a saddle horse. This often ends with the animal being put down. Mustangs and modern saddle horses are both descendants of Spanish horses from the time when Spain was the motherland of horse breeding. They are related both in terms of race and build. But while Mustangs have roamed free for the past 500 years, the evolution of the modern saddle horse has been controlled by man. All the horses that we breed today came out of stock that looked just like this. It's just that people, um, people bred for what they preferred, yeah. be it long legs or a certain face or a certain head shape. Mustangs weigh around 400 kilos and are fast and very athletic. Modern saddle horses, on the other hand, are bred as large, heavy animals of about seven to 800 kilos, but they have retained the angled leg joints characteristic of a horse weighing only 400 kilos. This gives saddle horses a certain suppleness and speed, but when a horse weighs 800 kilos, its legs cannot take the strain for long. The legs wear out and develop joint disorders. Mother Nature, I think, is a, is a better breeder than we are. Yeah. Those animals with those conformation faults that have the potential to compromise the breed usually do not have the opportunity to reproduce. And hence, those components are eliminated from the breed, whereas we have the ability to breed anything. And despite the fact that we know we have potential problems that will be passed on genetically, will continue to breed those, either due to greed or misplaced affection or other issues. Riverton, Wyoming is home to one of the five state prisons in the USA where wild mustangs are tamed. It's an open prison with 150 inmates. They have served part of their sentence in other prisons and must exhibit good behavior to be placed in Riverton. Some of the things they learn about here are farming and how to train wild mustangs. Well, it's, it's different coming to prison and serving my time doing something I like. I'm not no top hand on training a horse, but there, there's a, quite a difference between a wild horse and a domestic horse. They got a lot more spirit, these ones. Most of the inmates that we get here have never worked with horses, and so I think a number of them, you know, they come and, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. They're scared of the horses. But, you know, once they get into it, most of the inmates really see it as a good program, and, and, and I don't get that many requests for job changes once they get started. 17 months and you, you still don't get used to it. It's, it's like better than a cup of coffee in the morning. It's, it's just a big rush. It's fun, though. You're not nervous about it. 12 years ago, there were a number of prisons that BLM would, would use to, to train the horses, and, and we saw that, and we saw that as a really good opportunity to introduce you know, the same program here at the Honor Farm. And it looked like it would fit really well with what we tried to do, which is that focus on work and, and trying to give inmates a sense of accomplishment and a sense of pride in what they're doing and a sense of, you know, if they work hard and do the right thing, that they're going to do well. For educational reasons, training proceeds on different levels. Newly arrived inmates start at level one and only work with completely untamed horses. A little bit nervous, yeah. yeah. Things a lot bigger than I am, so. Uh -huh. We're strong? A little ner yeah, they're strong. A little nervous, not too bad though. I've been around horses a little bit, so. It wasn't too bad. Oh, eight or 10 men right through here and we'll have put four or five right through this. So just start lining out in the circle, fellas, right along the fence. The first thing they teach the horses is not to run at the sight of humans. The men were what happened? Yeah, that's okay. He'll come out. Here he comes. Let him come. All right. All right, you see him how he's looking at us here a little bit? That's what we want him to do right here. There. There's the stop. There, there he's figuring out. Right here when he stops and looks. Let him figure us out here. We're not putting any pressure on him. We're not trying to do nothing to him right here until he settles down just a little bit here. Later on the same day, they test how the horses react when they are tethered with a rope. Horse out. All right, just let him look. This is what we, this is what, this is what we like right here. 
If we can get that horse looking, there's the first step of leading right there. See there? And you see the boys hadn't even pulled the rope there. So that tells us right there that horse is, 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 is willing to do what we want him to do. This is a nice horse right here. Keep his nose to you just a little bit. Now, Brown, if you can get up to his nose, just rub his nose a little bit and then just slide your hand back over that. There. Now, just turn away and walk away there just a little bit. There you go. Come on down your rope a little bit. Now, when you, now stop right there, Brown. Next time, walk up to him there and rub his nose a little bit and just turn your head and just kind of back up that rope a little faster than that. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't be, don't, don't think he's going to do nothing. There. Now, there you go. There, yeah, just move right on back there kind of fast. There. That's good. But not all horses give in so easily. There's the, there's, there's the start. We ask the horse to come around. We ask him to stop. We ask him to wait for us. If he don't, then I'm wrong. I went too far, too fast, too quick. And then it, it's my program, not the horses. Mike Buchanan runs the horse program. His philosophy is that the inmates are not horse breakers, but horse tamers. He has left the old rodeo methods behind, whereby the horse's will was broken by use of force. Now they use teamwork, trust, and respect. Just, just try what you can, Paid, and just. When a horse is born in the wild, the first thing the mother does is start nuzzling them right at the point of the shoulders, right up high on the withers, and then they massage. That's that's the bond. We want to start massaging and petting him right around the uh, above the neck, right on the mane there, right on the withers. That's the first contact that the wild horse and the baby gets contact right there. Try it again, Pay. You're doing fine. Just keep going, keep going. See, he's wanting to do it now. Stay, keep your hand there, keep your hand there, keep your hand there, keep it there, keep it there, keep it there. That's okay, there, that's better. That's better. That's better. For the first time in their lives, the horses are bridled and must slowly become accustomed to wearing a saddle. First, when we saddle them, they're a little bit rough, you know, but after a little while, they, they gentle down and they know we're not going to hurt them, you know, so they trust, they trust us. We teach it a few little things here before we even get on. If we uh, tie up a right rein or a left rein and walk off with its head turned, the horse We'll understand right and left. So you can... And then what we look for here is a crossover. The left hind foot will cross over the right hind foot. The reason why that's important is because if you was on top of that and the horse decided to do something wild, we can pull on the rein, we can bump it with the left side, and it will unlock itself. Instead of buck run off, it will unlock and cross over. There. And now hold his head just like that. that that's, that's really important right here, that just don't pull it, just don't pull it. That's all. After a month of intensive training, the horse is calm and confident around people. Now is when it will become clear if the training has been a success. Will the horse accept having a person climb on and sit in the saddle? All right, now just step up there a little bit, count to three a little bit. There. And lay him known, pay him a little bit, stand a little bit. There. Yeah. Okay. Good.
Now, if you want to just stay right there, we'll turn this horse loose and then we'll see what happens. He don't know that he's untied. So we kick the inside leg, relax a little bit there. There we go, there we go, there we go. Kick that inside leg, just there you are. Relax, relax, give him just a little head. Just let him have his head just a little bit. In eight days, I, I kill my number and I'm gonna to go to Alaska and hopefully work in some riding stables. Uh, a lot of the programs really didn't help me, but the horse program, that's, it's a life changer. I mean, it doesn't have to be about money or, or girls or drugs or anything. That If I'm happy with myself and who I am, then I can make it. And that's why I wanna continue working in horses. The inmates really form a bond with the horses. Um, you'll even see in the auctions when the horses are being offered for public sale that, uh, as they're, as they're leaving, you know, the, the inmates will uh, express a little emotion, maybe even see a tear from time to time. So yeah, the bond is, is pretty tight between the horses and the inmates. Let's do that one more time. Here, just to make sure. Come on around over by this pond, and then just stop, and hold them, look over your shoulder, give them the right signal, and turn and go the other way just a little bit, okay? That's good. Now just turn around and go the other way. It's all just a little bit. Always stop your horse. Make him stop and turn. Look over your shoulder, Billy, and just turn over and look around. Just come on right on back. That's good enough. All right. All right. That's good, fellas. That's good. Adoption is the last stop on the Mustang's path from freedom on the plains to a new life around people. The trained Mustangs are sold at auction, although it is called adoption because of the stringent restrictions regarding their sale. People must apply to become approved as adoptees and are obligated to give the horse a good life. The authorities constantly check that people live up to these obligations. If during the first year it becomes evident that a horse is suffering from neglect, the authorities can take it back. Adopting a Mustang has become very desirable, especially the rare Mustangs with Spanish blood in their veins, which are sold for large sums of money. It was a real surprise for us when we came in on Monday morning and heard that we had a wild horse adopt for $19,000. Um, we have a lot of horses adopt for the, in the thousand to two thousand dollar range, special animals, especially those that have been trained through the correctional facilities. But nineteen thousand dollars was unique, and I hope we could see that again someday. Experienced horse owners, brave enough to adopt an untamed horse, can acquire a pure Mustang for an administration fee of only one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Horses that are too old to be tamed or adopted are not put down, but released into large grassy sanctuaries in Oklahoma and Kansas, where they live until they die a natural death. The wild horse is a symbol of the West and the, and the frontier movement, and uh, it will always be that way. A living legend lives on in freedom, unhindered except for man's regulation of the population. Mustangs have more than ever become a symbol of wild, unspoiled nature. <laughs>